And the title for this sermon is Potential Followers of Jesus. Potential Followers of Jesus. In this passage, we see three potential followers of Jesus. They are not named. No reference is ever made to them again. We don't know what happened to these three. All three had opportunity to follow the Lord. Two of them came to Jesus and said, I will follow you. One Jesus called out to and said, follow me. But all three had something that was holding them back from following Jesus. One man was too hasty in his commitment to Jesus. He did not count the cost. And as a result, as far as we know, he did not follow through on his intention to follow Jesus. One man had other priorities. There were other things that he valued more than following Jesus. One man was not fully devoted. He said he would follow Jesus, but his focus was on what was behind. Jesus instructed all three of these potential followers. His instructions to them were short and direct. Jesus did not mince any words. He told these men what they must do. He told them the realities of discipleship. As we look at these three potential followers of Jesus, it will do us no good if we merely scrutinize them, consider what may be their faults. Again, the Bible tells us precious little about any of them. But we will focus this morning on applying the words of Jesus to ourselves. May we, by the grace of God, count the cost of discipleship, cast aside all secondary things, and follow Jesus with a singular focus. Before we begin in this passage, let's once again go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, these words can seem shocking and difficult even to receive what you said here in this passage. Lord, I pray that we would be humbled before your word this morning. And Lord, that we would not have the focus anywhere else that is on critiquing anyone else, but rather may we critique ourselves before your word this morning. Lord, may the Holy Spirit work here in our hearts and our lives. Bring us more and more into conformity to your will, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first, we will look at counting the cost. The first potential disciple is introduced here in verse 57. The verse begins, and it came to pass that as they went in the way. What way was that? What road was Jesus traveling? They were headed south, if you remember, from the region of Galilee down to Jerusalem. Jesus had set his face to go to Jerusalem, as we saw last week. And what awaited Jesus at Jerusalem? Luke 9, 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders, of the chief priests and scribes, and be slain, and be raised the third day. This is what Jesus was traveling toward. And as he traveled that road to Jerusalem, he was approached first by this man in verse 57. Now look at what this first potential follower said to Jesus. Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. This man began with a respectful address. He called Jesus Lord. This would have been a respectful way to address someone that you recognized as a superior. In the New Testament, sometimes it's used to refer to an earthly master, and it's also used as a term for God. Now, this respect is surprising when we look at the parallel account in Matthew 8, 19, where we learn that this man was a scribe. Scribes in Israel were originally found among the priests and the Levites, their primary work was to teach and apply God's law. After the return from the captivity and during the intertestamental period, the scribes became an independent group, but they were closely associated with the Pharisees. As a group, the scribes never held political power, but they became leaders among the people due to their role as teachers. They were considered qualified to teach in any of the synagogues. Now, as a whole, the scribes were opposed to the ministry of Jesus. As we go through the Gospels, we see many, many examples of this. In Luke 5, 21, the scribes were among those who accused Jesus of blasphemy. In Luke 5, 30, the scribes murmured against Jesus because he ate and drank with publicans and with sinners. In Luke 6, 7, we're told the scribes watched Jesus on the Sabbath day to see if he would break their laws so they could accuse him. As we go on in the gospel, we'll see that the scribes exercise themselves towards Jesus' destruction. In Luke 19, 47, 
We're told the scribes sought to destroy Jesus. Luke 22, 2 says that the scribes sought how they could kill Jesus. Luke 23, 10, the scribes accused Jesus before Pilate. As a group, the scribes did not like Jesus. And yet this scribe sought Jesus out. He found Jesus as he was traveling on this road to Jerusalem, and he addressed him as Lord. Lord. There were times when the scribes used complimentary language when addressing Jesus as they sought to entrap him with words. But this scribe seems genuine. As far as you or I could tell, had we been there, this man appears sincere. Undoubtedly, this man believed himself to be sincere. Learn from this, that we can believe good things about Jesus. We can say good things about Jesus. We can call him Lord. We can make great confessions of commitment to Jesus, as this man did. And yet, in the end, have no real desire to follow Jesus. We can easily be self-deceived. We must examine ourselves carefully by the Word of God. Well, the scribe began with a respectful address. And he went on to state a good intention. I will follow thee. This is the language of discipleship. One of the primary ways to receive a religious education in Israel at this time was to follow a rabbi. And you would literally follow that rabbi around as he traveled and as he taught. You would serve him. You would listen carefully to his teaching. You would adopt that teaching. and You would support what he said. For the scribe to say to Jesus, I will follow you, shows that he believed he needed to learn from Jesus. He wanted to be a pupil under Jesus. He wanted to serve Jesus, follow Jesus, listen to Jesus, adopt and support the message of Jesus. And that is a good intention. By the grace of God, may this be the testimony of every one of us. I will follow Jesus. But take warning. Do not say, I will follow Jesus without first counting the cost. This man had good intentions, but he made a rash promise. His rash promise is found there at the end of verse 57. Whithersoever thou goest. He said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow thee. Whithersoever thou goest. Well, where was Jesus going? Several facets of Christ's ministry we can consider when answering this question. Consider Jesus' earthly ministry. During his earthly ministry, where did Jesus go? He went to despised sinners. In Luke 5.29, we read that Jesus went to a feast with a great company of publicans. Publicans were tax collectors for the Romans. Jewish publicans were despised by other Jews. The Jewish opinion was that publicans had sold their souls for monetary gain. Publicans were anathema. But Jesus went to the publicans. In Luke 7, Jesus received and forgave a woman who was infamous for her sins. As a scribe, the man in our text would not have previously gone to people like this. Would he now follow Jesus as he went to despise sinners? Jesus went to the sick. Jesus healed people who were sick with infectious diseases. Jesus touched people who were ceremonially unclean. In Mark 1.40, we read that Jesus touched a leper as he healed him. That was unthinkable to a conscientious Jew. Very, very strict laws concerning separation from lepers. In Luke 8.44, Jesus was touched by a woman who suffered under a condition that made her unclean. Jesus did not reject her. Jesus comforted her. Jesus commended her faith and then sent her away in peace. Would this scribe follow Jesus as he ministered to the sick and to the unclean? Jesus went to the disabled, those who could not see, those who could not hear or speak or walk. Jesus healed many who were afflicted like this and ministered among them. These people were often rejected in Jewish society because it was believed that their disability was the result of some sin in their life. We have a very clear example of that in John 9 verse 2. Would this man follow Jesus as he ministered to people like this? Well, this is where Jesus went during his earthly ministry. Consider also where Jesus was going when this scribe came to him. Jesus was bound for Jerusalem. His face was set to go to Jerusalem. Why? What awaited our Lord in Jerusalem? 
Now, as we saw last week, ultimately, Jesus would receive glory in Jerusalem. He would be raised from the dead. He would ascend into heaven and be seated at the right hand of the Father. But between Jesus and glory stood the cross. Jesus was headed to Jerusalem where he would face rejection, betrayal, suffering, and death. Remember the words of Peter at the Last Supper. In Luke twenty-two thirty-three, 33, Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. But we all know the story. Before the sun rose the next morning, Peter had denied Jesus three times. Would the man in our text fare any better? Would he follow Jesus when all the other disciples were scattered, when they fled, or when they denied their Lord? Would he follow Jesus to the cross? We don't need to speculate about this man. We know that Jesus went to the cross alone. No one went with him. No one could have gone with him. Jesus was the only acceptable sacrifice. We also know that none of the disciples stood by Jesus when he was arrested in Jerusalem. They all fled. Now, some crept back and watched the trial and the execution from a distance, but none of the disciples stood by Jesus. The man in verse 57 of our text, he made a bold assertion that he would follow Jesus wherever he went. But it was a rash promise and one that he would not fulfill. We need to be careful about making rash promises to the Lord. In the parable of the soils back in Luke 6, in verse 13, Jesus warned that there are some who will receive the word with gladness. They will demonstrate a response to the word of God, the gospel, that looks very much like saving faith. But when temptations come, they will fall away because there is no true root of faith in them. Commitment to Christ is not something to take lightly. A profession to follow Christ, like we see from this man in verse 57 of our text, is is no trivial matter. Do not make a rash promise to the Lord. Count the cost. Jesus warned this man about the reality of following him. Look at Jesus' warning in verse 58. Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. What had motivated this man to commit himself to Jesus? We don't know. But Jesus, who knew what was in the hearts of men, reminded this man that he, Jesus, was poor and destitute. Do not follow Jesus for goods or glory in this life, The Son of Man did not even have a place to lay his head. In these words from Jesus, we see two things. First, we see the very real and extreme poverty that Jesus submitted himself to while he was upon the earth. And second, we are reminded as disciples of Jesus to lay aside greatness in this world. Jesus submitted himself to real and extreme poverty. Think again about who Jesus was. He's the rightful king of Israel in the line of David, he was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. He was the Lord of creation. And yet Jesus did not enjoy any temporal benefits or privileges consistent with his exalted position. He was not laid as a baby in a cradle of ivory and gold, but he was laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. He spent his youth in subjection to his earthly parents, most likely doing the humble work of carpentry alongside Joseph. As he traveled about during his earthly ministry, he relied on the generosity of others for support, as we saw in Luke 8, verse 3. He rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on the back of a borrowed donkey. At the time of his death, all he possessed were the clothes on his back. Not only did Jesus not enjoy temporal benefits or privileges consistent with his exalted position, but he was truly poor. He lacked those things of necessity that even the dumb creatures possess. Foxes have holes in which to rest. Birds have nests to return to in the evening. But the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. All this is just one facet of the humility that Jesus took upon himself to accomplish our salvation. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Jesus experienced very real, very extreme poverty. 
learn also from the example of our Lord not to value the things of this world. Poverty, for poverty's sake, is not commendable. There's nothing inherently righteous about being poor, nor is there anything inherently wicked about being wealthy. We should be faithful, we should be diligent, we should be honest and hardworking in every aspect of our lives as unto the Lord, as a form of worship unto God. And those traits, the principles of sowing and reaping, they're often followed with a measure of temporal success in this world. But the things of this world are a secondary concern to us as Christians. If we are ever called to go without these things for the gospel's sake, we would gladly give them up. In 1 Corinthians 4.11, Paul wrote, For even unto us, this present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. If the loss of our temporal possessions is ever put upon us as the cost of the gospel, then may we be content to live as Christ lived. This verse also teaches us to lay aside ideas of greatness in this world. The potential follower of Jesus in verse 57 said, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, I don't have a place to lay my head at night. If we intend to follow Jesus, we must lay aside our ambitions in this world and look for the world to come. Take warning. Don't try to make something out of Christianity that it is not. It is not a means for advancement in this world. It's not a five-step plan to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Don't try to bring together the passing elements of this world and the eternal kingdom of Christ. Don't try to make something out of Christianity that it is not. But also, don't make anything less of Christianity than it truly is. It is the way of life as opposed to the way of death. It is the way of peace as opposed to the way of conflict. It is the way to heaven as opposed to the way to damnation. It is the way of eternal rest in and fellowship with God, our Creator, as opposed to the way of eternal separation from all of God's benevolence. In Ephesians 3.8, Paul rejoices that he is able to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. The riches we have in Christ is worth more than all this world, more than a thousand worlds. Don't make anything less out of Christianity than it truly is. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The primary focus of the Christian life is to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the things of this world, God will either add to us or he will take away from us as he sees fit. Those things are not our priority. We seek Christ. So far, we've looked at one potential follower of Jesus from our text this morning. This man sought out Jesus and said, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus reminded this man that he was poor and destitute in this world. He did not have a place to lay his head at night. Count the cost of discipleship. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we do not look for greatness in this world. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The second potential follower of Jesus we see in this text was challenged by Jesus about his priorities. This man was approached by Jesus. In verse 59, Jesus called out to him and said, follow me, follow me. And these were words that Jesus routinely used. In Matthew 4.19, Jesus called out to Peter and Andrew and said, follow me. In Luke 5.27, Jesus called out to Levi, the publican, and said, follow me. Our Lord's call upon these men was effectual. Peter and Andrew left their boat and their nets, their livelihood of fishing. They left it, and they followed Jesus. Levi left his tax booth and followed Jesus. But here in our text, we see an example of a call that was not effectual, as far as we know. This man did not respond to Jesus' call by laying aside what he was doing and following Jesus. Rather, he asked for a reprieve. He needed some time. There were very real and pressing needs that he had to take care of. Learn from this that the gospel call goes out to everyone everywhere. Repent and believe the gospel. 
Acts 17.30 says that God now commands, commands all men everywhere to repent. As Christians, we are under commission to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone, every creature. Now, how do we know if God is effectually calling someone with the gospel? How do we know if God's call on us is effectual? There's only one biblical measure that we're given. Obedience. Obedience. Did you obey Christ's call? Christ's command to repent and believe the gospel? Or have you hardened your heart to the revelation of God's grace and God's mercy? Who are you like? Are you like Peter, Andrew, and Levi, who left their old life to follow Jesus? Or are you like this potential follower of Jesus in our text, who heard the call of Jesus upon his life, but he had other things in his life which took priority over immediate obedience to Jesus? Every time you hear the gospel, you have an opportunity to repent and believe. Do not harden your heart to the grace of God. We do not know when God's mercy will end and his judgment will begin. Well, what had higher priority in this man's life? We might expect something terrible. What horrible sin had such a grip upon this man that he excused himself from Christ's call to follow him? What addiction was this man so entangled in that he could not break away to follow Jesus? What corrupt and perverse idolatry was this man so enslaved to that he would not follow Christ? We might expect something terrible, but the reality seems rather benign. Look at what this potential follower said to Jesus in verse 59. Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. If ever a person had a a reasonable excuse, surely this is it. Now, there's some debate about what exactly this man was asking from Jesus. It could be that this man's father had really just died, and that this man was asking for a day to go and bury him. Now, this seems unlikely to me. If this man had to travel any distance to bury his father, he would have already been too late. By the time word reached him that his father had died, and then he reached his father, he would probably be too late to bury him. The Jewish tradition was to bury their dead, within 24 hours. That's still practiced in some parts of the world today. There are very few possible scenarios where a Jewish man could meet Jesus on the road through Samaria and yet still be able to reach his father in time for the burial. Now, that being said, it's still possible that this man's father truly had recently died. Uh, There may have been extenuating circumstances that delayed the burial until the son could arrive, or maybe his father was near at hand. It's also possible that this father was still alive, but in need of his son's care and provision in his old age. And this son felt the responsibility to care for his father until he was dead and buried. He did not outright refuse Christ's call to discipleship, but he sought a delay until he was free from the duty he owed to his father. Now, either way, if you or I were met with this sort of excuse, we would understand. If we tried to make plans with a friend and they said, well... I can't, I, I have a funeral I have to go attend. Or, or I can't, my elderly parents need my help. They need me to go and, and help them with something. Well, we would understand. We would not hold that against our friend. We would say, yes, of course, go, go to the funeral. Or go take care of your parents. That has, a, that has a much higher priority than the thing that I suggested. But that's not how Jesus responded. Jesus demanded first priority in this man's life. Look at verse 60. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. These words may be shocking to us. I'm confident that they were a shock to those who first heard them. Jesus allowed no excuse from this man. He demanded first priority in this man's life. He demanded priority even over this man's father. Now make no mistake here, Jesus was not minimizing the responsibility of honor that a child is commanded to show to his parents or any other family duty or responsibility. The Bible is very clear on this. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Ephesians 6.2 says, Honor thy father and thy mother. And that's quoted directly from the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother. 
This is the very first commandment that has to do with horizontal relationships. What God requires from us as we interact with other people. The very first command dealing with human-to-human interaction is to honor your father and your mother. Family is important. God puts a high priority on it, but not higher than himself. The very first command is this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God, not family, must have that first place of honor in our lives. Now notice that in verse 60, Jesus added some details to the original call. In verse 59, Jesus said, follow me. In verse 60, he added, preach the kingdom of God. There was kingdom work for this man to do, and he must give top priority to those things which were God's top priority. And finally, Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. What does this mean? Jesus was not forbidding the burial of the dead, but these words serve as a warning. Whatever diverts us from following Christ, whatever delays us or turns us from serving him, deserves no better name than death. Truly, life is found only in Jesus Christ. Let those who are dead in this world, to the matters of this world, let them tend to the matters of this world. You follow Christ. This passage warns of particularly strong yet subtle temptations which can draw us away from following Jesus. We're often tempted to rest in a form of discipleship that is so broad in its scope that it becomes meaningless in our lives. We want to be called by Jesus. We would acknowledge some level of commitment to him We find some level of comfort in that. And and we may intend at some time in the future to draw in close to him, to be strict and consistent in our walk with him. There are so many other matters for us to attend to now. We want to be disciples of Jesus as long as that doesn't affect what we are doing now. As long as that doesn't mean we actually have to follow him now. Bend the knee now. Give him priority now. We want a form of discipleship that is so broad and so abstract that it doesn't have any effect on our lives now. I warn you, and I warn myself, Jesus has no interest in abstract disciples. Jesus doesn't want promissory notes of discipleship. Jesus does not say, follow me at your convenience. He simply says, follow me. He commands, follow me. Another strong yet subtle temptation is to think that our duty to family excuses us from our duty to God. The family bond is one of the strongest bonds that exists between people, and that's by design, God's design. God is pro-family. We looked at verses talking about that earlier. And because of this, family often appears as a very plausible excuse for us to neglect our duty to God. It's very appealing. It can even appear like the right thing to do. This is a very strong and very subtle temptation. Richard Wormbrand, in his book, Tortured for Christ, shared accounts of his own suffering and the suffering of other Christians under the communist government in post-World War II Romania. One account that he shared is of a father who was forced to choose to either renounce Christ or watch as his son was shot. What a choice. The testimony is that as the father wrestled with this decision, his son, who was also a believer, and only in his early teens, saw his father wavering, And he cried out to him, and he said, Father, do not renounce Christ for my sake. The testimony is that both father and son remained faithful to Christ unto death. Did that father make the right choice? 
Should he have renounced Christ for the sake of his son's life? Would it have made any difference? No. Everything else is of secondary priority to Christ. He must have priority above everything else in our lives. And that's easy for us to say as we sit here and we think about that father and the imp impossible choice, that awful choice that he was forced to make. It's much more difficult to refuse to renounce Christ in our own lives. Oh, we can recognize that Christ must have top priority when it's abstract to us, when it has no bearing on our own day-to-day -day lives. But when it comes time for us to choose between our family and our God, how quick are we to deny our Lord? Sometimes it seems as if we are looking for opportunities to deny him. Not to save the life of a family member, but for the sake of convenience, for the sake of comfort, for the sake of worldly ambition, for the sake of sports or games or school or sleep or rest or a million other things, for the sake of not offending someone. This happens in all, in all sorts of areas in our lives, but we are especially prone to this temptation with family. The Bible puts a high value on family, and so we think, well, I can value this, and whether we state it or not, I can value this higher than Christ. No. Jesus must have top priority in your life. And only when Jesus is in his rightful place, on the throne of your life, will you be able to truly love Truly honor, truly serve your family as he commands. Again, the words of Jesus in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We must guard against strong and subtle temptations which can draw us away from following Jesus. Don't be tempted by good things away from the best. Well, so far we've looked at two potential followers of Jesus from our text. The first man was reminded by Jesus to count the cost of discipleship. The second man was reminded that Jesus must have top priority in his life. Nothing else, no matter how noble or commendable, can be given priority over obedience to Jesus. If he does not have first place in your life, he will not have any place. The third potential follower of Jesus was not fully devoted. We're introduced to this potential follower in verse 61. Like the first man in our text, he sought out Jesus and he said to Jesus, I will follow thee. This is a good and commendable thing. This is the confession of all true disciples of Jesus Christ. I will follow thee. But this man's commitment comes with a caveat. I will follow thee, but... He had terms and conditions that accompanied his discipleship. What were his terms? Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home, at my house. Now again, this may seem to us to be harmless. Why shouldn't this man go and say goodbye to those who are at his house? Remember, Jesus has told his disciples that those who follow him must take up their cross. Jesus has said that he's going to be killed in Jerusalem. Jesus has just testified of his lowly position in this world, so lowly as to have no place to lay his head. Jesus has just claimed a, a place of absolute priority, even higher than a person's parents. Now, this man may rightly have thought that following Jesus could cost him everything. Following Jesus might cost him his life. He wanted to go home and say goodbye to the people there. What's the harm in that? In fact, this request is very similar to what we see from Elisha in 1 Kings 19. The prophet Elijah had cast his mantle upon Elisha, which was symbolic of Elisha's role in service to God. He was to pick up the ministry as God's prophet in Israel, where Elijah left off. And when this happened in 1 Kings 19, verse 20, Elisha, he left the oxen. He was plowing a field. He left the oxen, and he ran after Elijah. And he said, let me, I pray thee, Kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. The man in our text, his request seems reasonable, and it, it seems harmless. And once again, you and I, we don't know what was in this man's heart, but Jesus did. And look at how Jesus responded to him in verse 
62. Jesus calls for total and unwavering commitment. Look at verse 62. Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus told this man, If you look back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. In what ways may this man's request have been wrong? Well, he was wrong if, when he considered following Christ, he only considered the personal cost. In following Christ, there is a cost, a tremendous cost. And we looked at part of that cost earlier on. We were looking at that first potential follower of Jesus who failed to count the cost. But what is that cost compared to what is gained? Again, the the unsearchable riches of Christ. Philippians 3.8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and you count them as dung, as filth, that I may win Christ. Count the cost, yes, but focus on Christ. This man was wrong if his concern for his affairs at home was greater than his concern for following Christ. What would his family think of him going off to follow Jesus? What about the affairs of his household, the day-to-day business concerns that he had? Was he concerned to get all these things in order before he followed Jesus? Again, there's nothing wrong with saying goodbye to family and friends. Nothing wrong with having well-ordered business in this world. We ought to do those things. But if those things are keeping us from following Jesus, then they have a wrong priority in our lives. We must make all things in our lives subservient to Jesus. This man was wrong if he was putting himself into a position to be tempted to not follow Jesus. By going back home to bid farewell to the people there, he would expose himself to some of the strongest temptations which could derail his resolution to follow Christ. A mother's cry, Father's disapproval, the strong influence of old friends to bring us back to our old ways. It is presumption to willingly place ourselves under such strong temptation. Now, if we face those temptations for the gospel's sake, we can trust that God's grace will be sufficient. But if we go out of our way to place ourselves in the firing line of strong temptations, we sinfully presume upon the grace of God. Consider what Jesus told this man. Jesus used an illustration about plowing. Jesus said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back. Now what happens if you're plowing a field and you are looking backward instead of looking forward? You can't plow in a straight line. You're going to mess up the furrow and that ground will not be fit to sow. The meaning of this illustration is that you cannot follow Christ as he requires if you are constantly looking back. And whoever tries to do so is not fit for the kingdom of God. Those are strong words. Those are the words of Jesus. No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Sobering words. We see an illustration of the same truth in the Old Testament account of Lot's wife. Consider that whole situation in Genesis 19. God sent an angel to warn Lot that the wicked city where he lived would be destroyed. Lot, we're told, was a righteous man. Lot feared God. Lot believed the warning. He went to his sons-in-law and tried to warn them that the city was about to be destroyed. But Lot and the rest of his family, they did not flee the city. Go back and read Genesis chapter 19. Verse 16 says... After Lot received this warning, what did he do? He lingered in the city. Even though he knew it was facing imminent destruction, even though he knew that it was under the judgment of God and it was going to happen soon, he had just been warned. He believed the warning. He believed what God had said. And yet he lingered there in that wicked city. This is the story of Lot's life. He lingered where he had no business being in the first place. You, Christian, you live in a world that you know is facing the imminent judgment of God. Why do you linger? 
There is nothing in the world worth lingering for. Lot lingered, and as a result, he lost everything. Well, eventually, the, lot, the angels there, they seized Lot and his wife and his two daughters and brought them out of the city. They carried them out of the city. And in Genesis 19, verse 17, Lot and his family were specifically warned to not look back. Do not look back at Sodom. But in verse 26, we read, But Lot's wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. She looked back. That doesn't seem like such a, a heinous sin. Why was it so severely punished? Her sin of looking back revealed what was truly in her heart. Sodom was in her heart. The world was in her heart, and her heart was in the world. That is how she had lived, and that is how she died. In Luke 17, 32, Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Take warning. What is in your heart? Are your eyes fixed ahead as you follow Jesus? Or are you looking back? 2 Peter 2.21 warns, It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. Looking back inclines us to draw back. And to draw back is the way of perdition. By the grace of God, may Hebrews 10.39 be our testimony. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but unto them that believe to the saving of the soul. Don't look to this world. Look to Christ. If you're not a Christian, look to Him for salvation. If you are a Christian, look to Him for strength to live the Christian life. To walk as a disciple. To truly say and to mean it, Lord, I will follow you. From our text this morning, we looked at three potential disciples. One man was too hasty in stating his commitment to Jesus. He did not count the cost. One man had other priorities. There were other things that he valued more than following Jesus. One man was not fully devoted. He said he would follow Jesus, but his focus was on what lay behind. The scripture does not tell us what became of these three potential followers of Jesus. Did they heed the words of Christ? At some point later on, did they truly follow Jesus? We don't know. The more important question for us today is what will become of us? We have heard the words of Jesus. Will we listen? Will we obey? Will we stop trying to follow Jesus with caveats, with terms and conditions, with reservations, with excuses, with delays, with compromises? To follow Jesus, we must count the cost. We must give him top priority in our lives and be fully devoted to him. Again, the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. All these things that we spend so much time worrying about. All these things that we devote our lives to. All these things that we put more value on than Christ. Let those things go. Seek first the kingdom of God and trust God to add those things or take those things away as he sees fit. He knows what is best for us. May we give him that first place of priority in our lives. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for these words. And Lord, we pray that they have shocked us this morning. Maybe they have shaken us out of spiritual lethargy. Lord, we've been content to be disciples in, in only an abstract way, where it doesn't affect our lives truly. Maybe we've been making compromises so as not to suffer for your name's sake. We've been giving something else or someone else or other concerns of this life. They may even be good things, Lord, but we're giving them the top priority instead of giving it to you. <coughs> Lord, may we be deeply convicted this morning. And then by the grace of God, may we go forward with renewed 
focus on serving you in light of what you have done for us at Calvary. It's in Jesus' name we pray.